webinar on creating self-improving organizations. We know there's a great interest in the topic and to learn more because you're over 700 registered users from 25 countries. And a special good morning to those of you waking up on the west coast of the US. But the real stars of the show are Henry Knieber and Niklas Modig. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. You two um, have worked together for a long time. What do you appreciate the most with Niklas? Well, it started when he wrote the first Lean book that was actually really easy to read and understand. So already there, I liked him a lot. But then after working together, he's just full of energy. It makes me inspired. And also the, the combination of both thinking and doing. There's a lot of people that are good thinkers or good doers, but finding that, that mix is uh, it's magical. Mm -hmm. And I know you enjoy working with Henrik. What do you appreciate the most? I mean, there are hundreds of things I could say, but if you go into YouTube and write Henrik Nieberg, three different things will come up. One is the best videos with millions of viewers regarding agile operational excellence in the most pedagogical way. That's one thing. But you also find movies or, or, or clips about climate change. Uh, and the third one is Henrik jamming with some weird hat. And I think that summarizes Henrik. Extremely value-driven, focusing on how to develop really efficient teams, but his heart is in the environment, but also with his family and just bluesing around. I think that's a very good description of who Henrik is. One of the most versatile people on YouTube. So great to have you. What's the main purpose today? Well, the main purpose of today is that we've been... Um, we had an idea some years ago that maybe we could start integrating lean and agile. I mean, I represent lean and Henrik represent agile. And instead of like saying, which is the best one? We said, well, what do these two concepts have in common? And maybe we can f create something that is on a little bit higher level where we can actually provide knowledge uh, in a different way. And that's why we have landed here. And this is like the launching of all the thoughts that we have had the latest years. Mm -hmm. What else have? do we want to give the views today, the participants? I guess we want to give a dose of inspiration. A lot of people come from different directions. People know Nicholas from the lean world and know me from the agile world. And there's so much commonality there. So we just kind of want to share what we're doing um, and how we hope to uh, kind of scale ourselves and helping companies apply these principles. I see that the chat is already active um, and you're calling in, telling us where you are. Um, this is a chance for you to really get the answers that you need and the inspiration that you need. So you're so free to use the chat for comments or for questions, um, resources, if you want to inspire from the perspective where you are. Uh, just let's, let's just see if it's working. It gives us a flavor just to know where you are and what's the view from where you are sitting. I could already see Vasa, Finland, uh, Granada in Spain, but what, what do you see from where you are now? Are you confined to the basement? Um, you have kids or pets running around? You know, the new normal is kind of a special way to get a peek of people's um, mix between private and, and um, personal and private and, and professional. So just give us that so we know the chat is working and uh, uh, we know a little bit more about you. Uh, Berlin, Trongsund, lots of green trees. Trongsund, that's south of Stockholm. My gorgeous garden. Great. Uh, Norway, Olesund. Mm. Miami, South Beach. Mm, that sounds really nice. Lockdown in Paris. In my kitchen, in my kitchen, in my kitchen, <laughs> in Not my surprised. basement, looking at some trees. Not so many kids or, or pets today. Um, keep that chat rolling. I'll pick it up continuously. Um, the guys really want your input to make sure this is as relevant and to the point as you expect. Um, before we start talking about solutions and ways of working, let's try and illustrate operational excellence because seeing is believing. And I'm looking at you because you're the master of simple, um, relevant uh, <laughs> illustrations. Um, what, what do you want to show us to begin with? Well, see, we could stand here and be boring and show lots of slides and talk about operational excellence in abstract terms, or I could just show a silly demo. So I'm going to go with the latter option and yeah. show a silly demo. 
and illustrate some th one of the core principles behind both Lean and Agile, uh, which, is, which is flow. Um, as Biota mentioned, I'm a fan of silly metaphors. Uh, so the metaphor of, of today is Lego bricks. And before we show the video, I'm gonna explain a little bit about, about, what, about what you're gonna see. Um, this brick represents um, a customer request and it's gonna be sent to a team of four people. And those four people are gonna execute that request by passing it between each other. So when all the people on the team have held this brick in both hands, then it goes to the customer. So go ahead and roll the video and let's, let's take a look at this. So there they are, working hard, and there's the customer. So first shipment done, right? So it's just a simulation, but there are connections to reality if you, if you choose to look for it. So there's another one, they're working, getting stuff done. Each person has like a specialty and they're applying their own specialty to the job, working together, getting these things done. However, what happens if we were to pause right now? Pause, right? Now imagine that the manager comes walking by. Here comes a manager walking by, takes a look, sees this instant in time, goes off to a meeting. All right, continue the movie. All right, people are working and here comes the next request and they're still working. And then suddenly pause again. Okay, manager comes back from the meeting, takes a look and what do you suppose the manager is, is thinking right now as he, as he looks at this? What are you thinking? Yeah, not many people working, right? It's only one out of four, right? Every time manager looks inside the room, it's, it's just one out of four people working. The others are just standing around. Seems like a bit of a waste, right? What are you saying? Oh, he wants me to fix this. He wants me to make sure that we are getting bang for the buck. These are expensive resources. We pay them a lot of money and we need to make sure they're working hard, right? Cool. So in the next video, in a moment, you'll see another version where I make sure that everybody is fully utilized and working really hard. So go for it. Let's see the next video. There they go. Watch them. Working hard. All being super busy. Okay, pause. All right. Manager comes in, wants to see how this whole, whole thing worked out. And lo and behold, look, they're all working super hard. Everybody's being really busy. Wow, we're getting bang for the buck, right? This is great. We hired these people, we paid them, and they're working super hard. It's perfect. Except if you take a <laughs> look at the right, you see the customer there? <laughs> like nothing really has been delivered. This is what we sometimes call the busyness trap. It's kind of a, a, a common problem in many organizations, uh, not just with passing Lego around. <laughs> uh, and we see it not only in teams when they're fully utilized, but we also see it um, in, for example, traffic systems. If, if you're in a, a traffic system where there's a car on every inch of the road, right? A perfectly 100% utilized traffic system is also known as a traffic jam and nobody's getting anywhere. So kind of in a similar vein, fully utilizing a traffic system means there is no flow anywhere. Or even on a laptop, if your laptop is working at 100% CPU, the processor is going at 100%, you got 15 things open. Sure, your laptop is being utilized fully, but that's not what you want because it's being super slow. So basically, if you optimize for, for busyness, all you get is, is, is busy people. So rule of thumb, 100% uh, resource utilization means 0% means flow. It's a bit counterintuitive, right? Because at a glance, uh, this looks like it's, it's efficient. People are working hard. But in practice, yeah, we have the customer there who's just waiting. So how do we fix this? How do we, how do we find a balance? Can we get a little bit better resource utilization than just one in, one in four people, but also without having this problem? Uh, and yes, we can. Using this brilliant uh, trick from the lean world, which was uh, um, uh, stolen into the agile world, uh, and that principle is, is, is called flow or, or pull. So we'll illustrate that using another video in a moment. And what's happening in that video is the team is pulling work. So instead of me pushing in work, the team is taking a box and they're pulling one, one item at a time. So let's, let's roll it and see how it looks like. So pull is happening right here, right? Pull a task when you have capacity, pull the next one, etc. So now we have roughly the same flow time as before, like the end-to-end -end time to get a brick through the system. We have a little better resource utilization, 
But most importantly, it's a self-adjusting system. We don't need to worry about keeping everybody busy. They'll keep themselves just busy enough. And notice now they're all passing green bricks. So what happened was they got customer feedback because they're so fast. And through that feedback, they learned that green is, is, is worth more. So they're passing green. And now they uh, adapted again. They learned that now the customer needs yellow. So we not only get better flow, we also get better adaptability to, uh, to customer needs. That's a, a practical example of, of flow in action in a very silly metaphor. Thank you, Henrik. Niklas, so what are the principles that you want to illustrate with this example, this exercise, which was very appreciated, lots of comments in the chat? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, as we said, that we are here to talk about operational excellence and uh, flow is one of the core principles that we try to teach or, or I mean, communicate in everywhere we are. And um, a principle, I mean, we see it as an intersection. We have to make a decision and we have to think about what decision do we need to make? Shall we prioritize flow or shall we prior prioritize island thinking or capacity utilization? So I think um, this uh, example is a brilliant illustration of how the world is working. If we look into healthcare, are we optimizing ourselves around the doctor and make sure that he or she is busy and make sure that he or she always have a patient? Me exactly as the Lego, making sure that they are busy, or do we optimize ourselves around the patient so the patient can flow through the system and get healthy? That's good for the patient, but an unhealthy patient generates new ideas, new ideas, new problems, and it becomes uh, something that we need to take care of. But if we are organized at islands, it's very, very difficult to handle those type of cases. Mm -hmm. So um, Henry called it the business trap. We call it the efficiency paradox. Um, it's just an illustration of one principle that we believe um, that every organization should understand what is efficiency for us. Shall we prioritize flow with our customers in focus or shall we make sure that everyone is busy? And, and, if, and if you look into many kind of well-known lean and agile methods and frameworks, you'll see that this principle is built in. For example, in Scrum, in sprint planning or daily Scrum, it really is about pull. So it's useful to, to know these principles so that you can uh, yeah, see the connection. Mm -hmm. So your view on operational excellence, tell us, what is it? In very simple terms, I would say it's just being awesome at what you do. Uh, I like the term operational excellence. It's a little more self-explanatory than agile and lean. Uh, but basically, whatever it is you do, whether it's packing, passing Lego bricks or taking care of patients or building software or cooking food, just continuously improving the way you do that, to me, is what operational excellence uh, is. Mm -hmm. And just for clarification, before we sort of dig into the area of operational excellence, what's the connection then to lean and agile? How do the three um, fit together? Well, I mean, if we say operational excellence, it's more of like an umbrella where we can put different improvement concepts. We have agile, we have lean, we have lean startup, we have Toyota production systems, we can put in design thinking. Those are concepts, but operational excellence, we see it more as an umbrella word or an umbrella concept. But even if we have it as an umbrella concept, I mean, if we take lean, lean is focusing on flow, but it was developed within manufacturing. It's the product flow. I mean, lean is perfect, for instance, if uh, I know what someone wants. For instance, if my wife, Danielle, says, I want some sushi, I can use lean to develop flow in giving her sushi. But if she said, Niklas, I'm hungry, then I can't uh, use the lean because then I know in lean, I need to know what she wants. But then we come to the agile world, which is more developed for, hey, an iterative. So I can, how fast can I iterate and say, well, do you want this? Do you want that? Do you want that? Then agile is perfect for continuous testing to nail what does my wife want to eat? So it's, a, it's both flow. Flow is fixing the sushi, flow in the iterative process of making sure to identify the flow. So it's still the same process uh, or, or principle. It's just different context. Do we know what the customer wants or do we know or don't we know what the, what the customer wants? Yeah. And we believe that it's easier to talk about operational excellence than since it's, um, it, it's a general principle that all companies should understand. It, it also allows us to take context into account because in the, in the lean world, because it came from manufacturing, we tend to assume that variability is a bad thing. We want to have things as standardized as possible. In the agile world, we tend to assume the opposite because agile came from product development and software where innovation matters a lot. And if you want no variability, then you kill innovation. 
So we need, but we like to think of it as with operational excellence, we like to give context some more, like we want to take context into account. Sometimes you want to reduce variability. Sometimes variability is fine because we're innovating. Yeah. So there's a few comments here. Um, why is it so hard to think in terms of flow? Joseph, uh, Joseph Gassish is, has a, a, a sort of a, almost like a philosophical question here in the beginning of the webinar. Well, Think about you are going on vacation and a ski trip and you go out by yourself in the ski slope. You can have lunch whenever you want. It's easy because you don't need to care about anyone else. Or we take the situation where we are four families. And we say, let's have a lunch together. And you know, it's complete chaos because everyone has to adapt to each other. That's the reason. Flow, as you could see, everyone has to work together. Everyone has to see the same goal. Everyone has to see, this is my part and th this is your part. That's why it's difficult. However, it is difficult in the beginning, but once we know my position in the football team, we know that we can deliver superior productivity and much happier customers. But it's about adaptation and it's an effort in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And determination. Of to course. determine that this is the way we work. I mean, which is easiest, to stand on the driving range and, and look at my ball or being on a football pitch where you have to uh, adapt to everyone else. I mean, flow is uh, at the football pitch. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the golf, uh, that, that's when we only focus on ourselves and don't care about anyone else. It's almost that I like when Henry gets the slice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's talk more about what you've created, what you have created together, and your cooperation. Just for background, Niklas, what's your story? What are you bringing into this cooperation? Well, my story is that I um, lived in Japan as a kid and and got to know Japanese. So uh, once after I I, I started, um, I got the opportunity to start researching and. Uh, uh, in parallel with my, with my research, I actually was an aerobics instructor. Uh, uh, it was a crazy uh, time, but when I was studying business, I was teaching aerobics and I felt that the aerobics is so inefficient that participant doesn't understand. <laughs> so I started to apply lean on my teaching methods and I created my own concept uh, called value added aerobics. Uh, <laughs> and I got sponsored. So I was able to teach this uh, teaching methods all around <laughs> the world. And uh, then I ran into my professor and say, hey, what are you doing? I'm doing lean aerobics. And then he said, why don't you come and start researching uh, for us uh, here? And that, that was the actual starting point. And since then I've always been, uh, I mean, if you think about aerobics, you want to work out, that's the concrete value, but you also want to have fine, fun, that's the like, kind of a, the experience. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with companies, deliver quality and the concrete result, but also deliver great experience. And, that's and then you, you studied lean, um, you were on the inside of Toyota, you were studying um, the production system, you wrote a book on lean, has sold in hundreds and thousands of copies. And um, what, what, what was the real insight that you took away from all these years of seeing your book put in, put at use? You've been communicated a lot with clients who want you to come and speak, um, do training sessions. No, Where I, are you now? I mean, I, I got the opportunity to be inside of Toyota and uh, once I, it was a treasure for a researcher to come in there and when once i come back here to sweden i felt that i want to communicate that but then me and my uh, uh former colleague pat olson we wrote this book but i felt that all this thick management book i've never read any one of those because i'm a little bit as he said <laughs> energetic so i said how can we write a short book in an easy way that anyone can understand so we looked at astro lingerian books and and we started to dig into well why do i love the, the the first page in the da vinci code so it was a lot about storytelling and that has um inspired me a lot uh, storytelling both in written form but then uh, when we came in to to uh, actually packaging stories with video that was the starting point of my idea, maybe we can create a company um, that can scale teaching in a rapid way, but we'll come back to that yeah. later. But your, your, your urge to be engaging, to, be, to simplify uh, in order to onboard um, uh, thousands of people, that's, I think that knowing you for some while, that that's really a, characterizes you. Um, you. You really want to see change as well. Hendrik, um, what about you? What's your story? 
I first have to say, Astrid Lindgren books were inspiration for This Is Lean. Yes. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, my story. I also grew up in Japan. Uh, he's better Japanese than me, even though I lived there much longer. That's funny. But uh, I grew up in Japan, came to Sweden as a, as a teenager, went to school, wanted to be a musician, changed my mind because I realized maybe it's hard to live as a musician, became a programmer. It was easier to make a living. Um, noticed as a programmer that most projects fail. And I started wondering, is this normal? Is this the way it's supposed to be? You know, hundreds of people coding for a year. And then at the end of the day, this product gets shipped that nobody wants to use. I just kept seeing failure and I was kind of a little bit like getting cynical. You know, is this the way it's supposed to be? But then later on, I started uh, getting involved in startups as an entrepreneur. And suddenly I had my own teams and suddenly I was, the, you know, <laughs> suddenly I was this guy, right? <laughs> and, and, and I have to figure out how we're going to work together. I, I, know, I know how to fail. I don't know how to, how to succeed. So I started looking around. Are there any software projects that have succeeded anywhere? And I started finding a few and looking at, well, what did they do? And I started finding patterns and I started applying those patterns. And those patterns later on came to be known as, as agile. Basic things, cross-functional teams, ship off and get customer feedback, um, self-organization. But it worked really well. So I started using that in my own companies, but also as a, as a consultant in other places. And over time, I got a chance to work with some really interesting companies. I spent a bunch of years at a Swedish startup called Spotify, which then grew really fast and and uh, later on worked with Lego in Denmark and got to see a little bit how does this work outside of software and now working with Mojang and Minecraft development. I, I really had a chance to see many different companies and try to learn, you know, what, what does it take to build a great product? Mm -hmm. And I'm curious. So that's, I guess, I'm trying to learn that. And I like spreading knowledge because through writing books and videos and stuff, because if I have to explain something in really clear terms, then I have to understand it myself. Otherwise, I can't get it out. What made you realize that um, an agile approach could be applied to almost any kind of development? In the beginning, I didn't realize it. I was just living in a software bubble. But then I noticed with every company I came to, if we applied agile and software, it almost inevitably spread to other departments, but in a slightly different shape. So I noticed after a while that the agile practices are quite software specific, but the agile principles are super universal in a similar way that, that lean came from manufacturing, but is, the principles are super universal. Mm -hmm. And what do you spend most of your time doing today? Uh, right now I do a Minecraft development and design uh, at Mojang almost full time, but I also spend a good amount of time coaching because the teams have grown a lot and we try to figure out how do we, how do we work effectively. Mm -hmm. So basically trying to practice what I preach, <laughs> I guess. Um, we are going to talk about your co collaboration, but because I invited you to the chat, uh, I thought I would just pick a few, even though they come in sort of uh, here and there. Um, we have a question. Um, Lean has been used um, for uh, product development for a long time. How is that different from agile product development? So I guess maybe echoing a little bit what Nicholas said earlier, uh, there's a lot of similarities, but they kind of come with different assumptions. Uh, lean can be applied to product development and innovation, but it came from manufacturing. So it tends to kind of assume that we know what the customer wants. Now let's deliver it faster and better. Agile came from software. So, so although the method isn't software specific, it has that root. And therefore in Agile, we tend to assume that we are in a complex world of innovation where we don't even know what the customer wants. So I guess that's one, one difference. Um, Do you want to add something, Niklas? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I want to challenge the person who actually, uh, I mean, asked us that question. Is Agile product development, what, what's the difference with lean product development? For me, it's, it's not... Uh, a question that is uninteresting. I want to know how do we develop great products? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that is the main, uh, that's the how is the interesting. I want to take the best from lean. I want to take the best from agile. I want to take the best from every, everything. How can we develop flow and happy customers when we develop product? That is the question. I'm tired of all this is lean or agile or now we have industry 4.0. Hallelujah. Let's just get rid of all the concepts and talk about the core principles. How can we make our <laughs> customers happy or how can we make sure that our patient get healthy? Mm. Uh, that's the right questions. Mm. So what has Mr. Agile and Mr. Lean cooked um, together? What, what are we going to talk more about today? That we are at least we are in a, a release women, webinar in a way. Well, I... Um, we have um, different stories. Um, I mean, we're going to launch operationalexcellence.com, which is a platform uh, where we will offer digital uh, training and transformation programs. But we have 
long histories of how we got into that. Maybe you can start with how you came to the conclusion that videos are quite effective. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so I, I do teaching from time to time quite regularly, or at least used to before COVID. <laughs> but and uh, what I noticed after a while is being in a classroom and teaching um, has limited scalability. <laughs> And I noticed at the same time as I was in classrooms teaching, I would put out videos. I put out, for example, a video called Spotify Engineering Culture, which people started referring to as the Spotify model. And it was just spread all over the place. And that video alone caused an amazing amount of change and transitions. Not all of them successful, but some of them have been successful. And I was kind of like, wow, I, you know, they, they did that without me. I put the video out there and that just started happening. And I see that over and over again. So that was kind of like an aha. And I think it was a similar uh, for you, or what was your realization? I mean, I I remember it very clear. I was working with a company, Gothenburg, and I had opportunity to work with the top management team for a day. And we talked about flow and everything within Lean, and they said, yeah, we want to do that. But the problem is that we are 1,300 people. Um, how, how can we make everyone get this mm -hmm. aha? How does it uh, scale? Yeah, how, yeah, how does it scale? And what we did then was that we gathered all the middle managers. There were 70 people. And I gave a lecture, but I had a camera person there recording the lecture. And I knew that it was going to be recorded. So we were able to cut it up into nine modules. And we took away all the discussions. We only kept the stories and the cases that is fun to listen to. And then we actually took those nine modules and put it down on a DVD and we burned 70 DVDs and gave to all managers and say, now it's up to you. Uh, show it for your employees and you lead the discussions instead of Niklas. And they were, I remember they were really uh, like nervous in the beginning, but we said you have to show one module per month during nine months. And I remember that the CEO called me after, uh, or if it was the chief development officer, and he said, Niklas, what the heck have you done? People are like crazy. And they didn't wait for the uh, next, for the no, next, no, the uh, first, but, but it's something if you are able to train 1,300 people at the same time, and it's not an external person that it's expert, it's the manager who owns the training, something very interesting happens. We build in ownership, we build, build in engagement and they are able to instantly apply the concept to their settings. Traditional management training brings out a few people from many different companies and they talk about general cases which is probably interesting but it doesn't help the company. So what happened here was that everyone got the same language and they were able to st start talking with each other and they saw improvement possibilities and they didn't need to explain why because everyone had the same base. So that was this is actually uh, 10 years ago now mm -hmm. and that was the starting point for me like okay there's something really interesting here but at that point we couldn't stream and do these digital platforms we had to go away around with dvds yeah. but it's it different was, now uh, it's very different easier. so um operationalexcellence.com um a, a part of it is uh, the uh, the self learning uh, but then there is a self training uh, then there is also self assessment and self development talk more about those parts of of your initiative yeah, I mean, both me and Hendrik, we realized that self-training is very powerful. Showing videos, using metaphors, user, uh, using story, storytelling and so on. So that's one part. But if we go back a little bit, I mean, our vision is to create self-improving organizations. And that is, how can we make sure that the company or organization can independently evolve? Then we have to break that down. If that's on the higher level, self-improving, well... Then self-training is one capability that we have to offer them. We can do that with these uh, training platforms. That's classical e-learning. But what we also have invented then is the self-assessment, uh, meaning that they can make a diagnose how well are we developed in different aspects. And once they've done that assessment or that diagnose, they can also self-improve or self-develop. And those three together, self-train, self-assessment, and self um, development, I believe, uh, is the engine that actually can help them continuously improve. I mean, think about it. If I was sick and I said, I'm going to self-heal, what do I need? Well, first, I need to be able to educate myself to know anything about health. That's the health self-train. Then I have to be able to self-diagnose myself. Uh, and then I have to self-medicate. It's the same thing. Self, uh, I mean, we, we have to know how to do it ourselves because we believe if we say you do it, that's when we give them the ownership and the engagement, and that is what needed for change. I don't, I don't know if you. Um, well, I guess I, I guess I can add one aspect there too. Um, 
like there's a classroom thing, right? Where as a teacher, I'm kind of in control of the situation, but then people have lots of great ideas during the class when they do exercises, debriefs and stuff. They have all these ideas. Oh, we should do this. We should do that. Then they go back to the company and that tends to get lost in noise. Um, when we when we put out a video and just throw it out on YouTube and see what happens and that triggers change, that's really powerful. But we, we find something in between where it's not us having to be in the classroom, but it's also not just a video that's just thrown out there without any kind of support. We want to find that in between where there's, where there's a structure, there is a program, things fit together. Plus there are touch points. It's not always being alone. Sure, as a, as a participant, you're watching videos and asking questions, but then there's workshops as well where you get together and you talk to the other people yeah. who've also been asking the same questions and you follow up on, hey, how, how's it going? Are we going to do some of these things that we talked about? So we kind of want to put it together into a package that doesn't rely on us as, as bottlenecks. Yeah. Um, I, I want to continue a little bit around that because imagine Hendrik's uh, Lego example. That's a five minute long movie. Imagine that you can take that movie and uh, let's take um, from healthcare, for instance, we have uh, breast cancer flow, for instance, or any type of flow. If Think if we were to be able to pick out all the people that are involved in both setting a diagnosis and, and treating cancer, we gather everyone at the same time and we show them Hendrik's Lego movie and say, this is the principle of flow. And then that's the self-training. And then we ask them, now we go into self-assessment. If you were to apply this principle to the breast cancer diagnosis, how do you need to change? Then we can tap into all, everyone's brain. Capabilities brain, or capabilities and, you need to develop. Exactly. And we can also ask them, what are the problems? So then they have made a self-assessment. And then we say, well, what do you need to change? That's a self-development. And it's very easy. Five-minute video, two, three questions, summarize that, and then say, let's go. I mean, it's not, it, it's not more difficult than that. Let's take a few comments. Um, I think you just answered this one. But uh, Marcus Pister is asking, a self-improving organization requires critical thinking, not problem problem solving within boxes or labels and i'm reading the question as how how does your solution also enable critical thinking right. and development of new ideas so i would say we're trying to get a uh, streamline the delivery of content part right there's no need to stand in the room to do that physically um, and also streamline the reflection part uh, by giving people questions to think about. But those questions don't give you answers. They just make you think. But then we do these workshops where people get together and talk to each other. And I guess that's where the critical thinking comes into play. But it's really important because when we teach principles, when we bring up examples, they are just examples. So you need to think about how to adapt that to your context. But we're basically giving the responsibility of critical thinking to you as a participant because you know your domain. It's hard for us to come and tell you what to do. So we give you ideas and inspiration and tools and then you apply critical thinking to figure out you know, how, how to make that helpful in your context. Mm -hmm. And Sidsel, um, let's see, Sidsel Winter Storo, she says, is this um, a renewal of the good old uh, Ishikawa quality circles? Well, again, uh, relying on concepts, I would like to ha her to ask, what does she actually mean? Let's take, uh, ask her to Sid's, ask the question uh, again. I, I, take I, away I, all the concept and ask me a question that anyone can understand. Ishikawa, I've heard it. I maybe, I'm quite knowledgeable about lean, but even if we start throwing away all this concept, no one understands. So get away with that and ask me the real question that anyone can understand. Mm -hmm. Then I will be happy to answer. You know, these uh, guys, they really want to cut away the BS and go straight to what is really the problem. So the more straightforward your questions are, the more likely I'll ask them to Henrik and Niklas. Um, it sounds so easy, Helena Westman says, and I think um, she's saying, I wish we could just start doing it more. Uh, that's how I'm reading that one. Um, if, retro, uh, if a retro, a retrospective, is a team-based self-improvement, what is the equivalent at scale in your solution? Uh, now we're getting pretty practical, but, but I find that most practices you use at a team level, such as retrospective, but also planning and road mapping, whatever you do at a team level in general needs to be scaled up if you're many teams. So if each team is doing a retrospective, which is a process improvement workshop, essentially, if we're going to debuzzwordify, right? yes. <laughs> process improvement workshop, then we probably need a retrospective across the teams, either with everybody together in a big room thing or a few people from each team get together and say, okay, what are the main issues across teams that we need to fix? And the same thing maybe at a department level. What are the main issues across departments? So I find that kind of roll up. 
is a good practice for almost any kind of you know thing you're doing, whether it's planning or retrospectives or whatever. Mm. Uh, this is also an interesting one from Caroline. She's in Calgary, Canada. She says, um, what do you suggest to help drive these types of changes um, if you're not a manager? How can she enable change? I think the question is, Niklas? It's a very important question, um, how to make this happen because if we say that we want to develop self-improving organization and we don't have top management commitment i would say it's almost impossible uh, because it requires you it's like if i have a personal trainer it's easy oh i have to go to the gym but he or she will do their work but if i'm going to go out jogging and i'm by myself it's very easy to co conv convince myself maybe i deserve some more sleep mm -hmm. and i think if we say that change can happen with technology and, uh, and smart training methods, but it's, it's digital, then it really requires the managers to, to, to tap in. And uh, I mean, as I said, just Google uh, <laughs> the, the cap capacity utilization trap with Henrik Nieberg and put that in front of your manager and say, this is what I want to, it, it's the Lego uh, um, part, uh, but on... Um, Start on, with on, the end in mind and show yeah. what you want to achieve. Show, show them... Henry, uh, the, the this is the one... Um... Wait, let me just add one thing to that, because there's a dirty trick I want to share when it comes to change, yeah. which is pretty much what you talked about. Now, I found, I've, in some cases, when I've seen a person with no formal authority cause massive change is when they visualize the current situation in a clear way. So let's say you are a person in a team and you happen to see a video, like maybe one of ours or someone else, showing a technique such as value stream mapping, which is basically showing when work gets done, how big part of that is work and how big part of that is waiting. I've seen examples where people would put that on the wall and show very clearly to anybody who walks by, man, it takes two years to develop a new product, but it's three months of work and it's visualized dead clear. And when enough managers walk by that wall, mm. stuff sometimes happens. So make stuff visual uh, and sometimes change happens. So the ability to visualize, and I've heard managers work together with visual artists or people who are just good at sketching and making an illustration of a problem. Maybe that's a, w a person to team up with. Oh, you, you don't need it though. That's the thing. These sketches are just boxes and arrows. So you don't need any artistic skills. What you do need is some visual, some metaphors and some ways of structuring the, the visualization. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, we love doing those kind of things. So we, a lot of our training material is oriented around making stuff visible in a clear way that you can draw without any artistic skills. Caroline from uh, Calgary says, thank you. Um, and another question is, um, w when you uh, are not there who, uh, to, to inspire, um, in what way does um, operationalexcellence.com enable sort of um, engagement despite managers saying we've tried this before um, I can't find the question now because there's so many questions coming <laughs> in uh, it rolled by no, but I think it's important I mean we use the digital training as a flipped classroom strategy meaning that if we have 10 individuals they look at all the videos like this Le Lego video maybe three of them and they get some questions and then they meet in a workshop where they discuss what do you think and what do you think and that's the core where the engagement and the decision and the in inspiration and the high five happens that we can take that away but we can take us away uh, we just make sure that they get the same inspiration and the same question and put them in a room and say let's discuss this because we have selected the question that we know if they discuss this change will start to happen mm -hmm. so so it's not only about sitting in front of a computer it's just a technique in order to make sure that people are talking about the right things in the right sequence mm -hmm. here is a bit um here's a yes Gunnar wrestling i took your question there uh, we do have time for some more real time um, consulting here. Um, this is great. Austin, Keep it on. <laughs> I work in an organization, Austin says, um, where no one can see the whole field, the football metaphor. Uh, at the same time, we are busy all the time. Where do we start with creating self-improving organizations? I think he answered his own question, though, in the first part. Nobody can see the whole thing. What can you do to make it visible? If not the whole thing, a little better than now. Because if you can't make stuff visible, improvement is hard, almost impossible, I find. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Um. um so uh, yeah so many good um good questions and good suggestions and thank you again helping each other um they're helping each other answer each other's questions <laughs> that's, that's great that's good that. that's it's, what I'm it's, telling. it's happening self-improving it's happening <laughs> exactly yeah um so what other values can you deliver in your in the new platform that you have created in 
We view our platform as um, a hub for knowledge where we develop training and transformation programs. Uh, an easy metaphor to understand what we actually do is to think about the book business. I mean, we, if we were not delivering e-learning or training programs and we were to deliver books, we are a publishing firm. So we publish training and transformation programs. Uh, but if we look into the uh, book publisher, they need authors and they need, need bookshops. And that's exactly what we need as well. The authors, that's our experts. Me and Henrik, we happen to be experts, lean and agile, but we are working, and especially starting to working with a lot of different experts within the field. We will start with operational excellence, but then we continue. So we need experts in order to create our books, meaning create programs. And then we are working with different bookshops, meaning different consulting firms and universities in different countries who are offering our programs to the local customers. Implementing training in the platform, using the platform yeah. for transformational change. Actually, we are going to meet a number of users um, who can describe how they have transformed learning and how they are using um, the platform. So let's let's invite them. Spring Consulting in Norway has helped spread Nicholas programs and books to thousands of users since 2017. Here to talk about the future of training is Hans Henrik Hans Erik Holmen. Are you with us, Hans Erik? Great to have you. We can't hear you. Mm. Just a second. Uh, I should be unmuted here, so... Perfect. Yay. Hey, Hans-Erik, how are you? Hi. Uh, great, thanks. Sunny Oslo, how are you? We're fine here. Uh, we're based in Stockholm. I, we didn't say we're in the studio in, in central Stockholm. What's your relationship to operationalexcellence.com, um, Hans-Erik? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, first, I just have to correct you a little bit because uh, uh, our company is called Sprint with a T consulting and uh, we are a Norwegian management consulting company uh, with uh, one of our key uh, focus areas uh, helping our clients achieve operational excellence and uh, our uh, relationship to operationalexcellence.com started back in uh, 2016. Um, I invited Nicholas to do some seminars together and uh, soon he started to uh, present also some of his uh, early stage uh, digital solutions uh, to us, which we had the pleasure of trying out with uh, some of our clients. Um, after a while, we started to work uh, more closely together in, uh, in transformation engagements, where we actually um, brought on uh, operationalexcellence.com and, and, uh, and Nicholas to, to join us to, to help these uh, large organizations uh, succeed. And... Um, also there, we, we, we started to pilot um, some improvements and some, well, maybe we could call it next generation of uh, operational.com's uh, uh, software and programs. So I would say that our relationship today is a really close uh, strategic uh, one, um, focused on the, on the Norwegian market, of course. And we have, uh, uh, during these uh, five years, uh, implemented operationalexcellence.com solutions in approximately 15 organizations, um, training, I guess, yeah, more than 10,000 people in, through these digital uh, solutions. Great news. Sorry for mispronouncing um, Sprint Consulting. <laughs> no, no. Um, so based on that experience, rolling out to 10,000 users, um, you've seen clients transform the way they work with training and education. Give us some insights uh, um, from what you've seen so far. So how much time do I uh, have? Like <laughs> Give it a minute at least. <laughs> a whole minute. Um, well, and uh, to, to begin with, um, organizations who, who, who want to, to transform, they want to see results and, and preferably really fast. Someone has developed uh, some kind of business case which have, has shown that this uh, here lays great opportunity. Um, but most organizations, they're, they're really... They really necessarily don't know what it takes to actually do these transformations, and uh, and uh, so so one of my uh, I guess uh, key insights here is that uh, change management uh, 
is really um, more important and and uh, much more challenging than, than than the strategy and the methods um, and uh, uh, not at least uh, creating the business case. In what so it's, way? It's really about in, yeah, it's it's really about. Um, engaging, engaging people, uh, great communications along the way, uh, of course, a good portion of know-how. I would say there are three things um, um, which stand uh, stand out. And first, you, you need to to work on how to motivate the organization for change. You need to have an idea about how to educate the organization, develop it into being able to think in new ways and 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 work in new ways and of course the third one making sure that um you have a plan for how to make the new knowledge stick and uh, and um getting turned into action mm. and and in all these um three areas i would say that we have had great uh, pleasure of uh, working with operationalexcellence.com um on the motivation side, um, our clients say that uh, working with these solutions, they they find it both uh, interesting uh, and fun. And the the, the 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 fun part is really really important. And I think it's as uh, Nicholas said um, in his introduction, and uh, and and Hendrik showed with uh, his great video example here that the story based training that's really the key uh, because it it creates kind of a shared. Uh, reference um, throughout the organization, and uh, and many times we see that it it, it really turns into a kind kind of a common uh, language, um, mm. and when people start talking together, that's when you really get momentum uh, in the change uh, in the organization. Mm. Um, Thanks, Hasri. Finally, um, very briefly, how have you seen that operational excellence dot com can enable scaling? Uh, what what why why is why does it scale so well? Um, yeah, that's uh, a, a really important question because uh, that's that's really um, one of the key values to uh, to 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 me as a management consultant. Uh, this this represents a new dimension of scaling uh, because. Uh, uh, pr prior to these digital <laughs> programs, we were scaling through uh, pilot projects, expert training, workshops, classroom education, external uh, courses, and so forth. But um, what these methods kind of have in, in, in common is that they, they, they scale really poorly and they're really uh, work intensive, um, man hour intensive. So with doing this digital, um, it's kind of having a turbocharged change management uh, engine um, uh, uh, compared to earlier. So Th um, great. Th I need to stop there. It's such a good, um, such a good story. To you, you've scaled. You've worked with so many people. Thank you so much, Francis, for sharing and for really proving that the platform works. Thank you for being with us. Um, at the Finnish um, School of Business, Hanken, um, the executive education program is being transformed by using digital training platforms like operationalexcellence.com. I'd like to welcome to the show uh, commercial director at Hanken, um, uh, Michael Rölisch. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Greetings welcome. from Finland. Very briefly, what does the future of training and learning look like in an executive education um, setting? Well, that's a really good question. I think that uh, one of the main points here is that the clients are looking for impact and uh, getting results faster and more immediate uh, than before. Uh, this means impact both on a business level and also on a people level. So uh, to be successful here, uh, what we do is we combine the best of two worlds, I mean, theory and practice, which means in a nutshell that uh, combining book smarts and street smarts. And uh, by that doing this, uh, we create the insights and, and try to deliver an engaging learning experience. Mm -hmm. And how does a platform like OperationalExcellence.com enable and support that development, that transformation? 
Well, one of the main things here is it's a new way. And I think that it creates a shared language and a understanding for the whole organization. And uh, I mean, uh, quite uh, frankly, as you said in the beginning, uh, when you say operational excellence uh, uh, and, and people try to define it, uh, they do it in many, many different ways. So um, what the companies are normally looking at is uh, a competitive edge. And they have a good idea, they have a good plan. But what they struggle with is actually execution and uh, creating the common understanding of what needs to be done. So here, I think that the operational excellence actually addresses both of these needs, the what and how. And at, as it has been described already here previously, it has a very pedagogically well-structured uh, format. Uh, it's interactive, engaging, uh, the scalability, that's a huge plus. And um, then you can go from igniting the renewal for the organization through inspiring, and then you go for the change and transformation in the end. Mm -hmm. Tell us how the platform complements more traditional um, management programs. Well, first of all, uh, this is a unique solution in a way that it's a business to business solution. Uh, there are many B2C solutions in the market. And um, what it does is actually it clear creates more clarity and creates the movement so that you can really uh, move uh, loads of people in, in the desired direction. Uh, further, it's also a flexible solution, which means that it's online, easily accessible. You can move at your own pace and then according to a certain time frame. So <laughs> why... From your experience, why do so many training and learning initiatives fail? What's the most common mistake? <laughs> well, uh, perhaps one of those is uh, the commitment uh, from from uh, from the top. Uh, perhaps the other thing is that uh, there are not clear objectives, or you have not clarified the desired outcome. Uh, perhaps also putting too much on the agenda, trying to achieve kind of a too broad perspective, or then perhaps in some uh, exceptions, there are the unrealistic expectations, what can be done uh, with time and, and, and the investment. What would you like to see more of in the platform going forward? Well, I think that uh, one thing that is unique, and this is something that, uh, as a Finn, I can say the Swedes are very good at it. Uh, they put uh, very uh, complicated stuff into easy accessible packages and that's something that I would like to also uh, say that uh, continue with that approach because uh, what we want to achieve is learning and, and change and renewal and through that uh, it's more easily accessible also. It's um, one, one of my English teachers said always that uh, the thing that is not very clearly thought out it's the, the thing that you say out in an unclear way and I think uh, by uh, thinking about this and, and uh, adding the storytelling to it, it's very, very exciting and also scalable. Mm, great. So the, the format itself is engaging and the fact that it yes. scales so well makes it so valuable for you. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today. Thank you. Um, many organizations need to scale up and level up um, their transformation initiatives in order to adapt to, to rapidly changing market and customer demands uh, and looking for new ways. And we're going to hear how the Swedish transport admi administration, Trafikverket, is managing the process. Uh, I say a warm welcome to Executive Director Roberto Majorana. Are you with us? Yes, you oh, are. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> so... Um, Roberto, you're in the middle of using Operational Excellence um, Program as a full transformation program. Can you tell us how it all started? Yeah, I would be. I, I'll be happy to tell you. Um, it actually started uh, uh, last year when we uh, uh, we were planning a big uh, leader summit in the spring of uh, uh, of last year uh, in May, actually. Uh, where we 
wanted to invite uh, Niklas Modig as a pres uh, to present um, his work. And um, uh, I had the chance and opportunity to meet Niklas in my former position in a, in a, uh, some years ago. And I was very eager to to have Niklas explain to my uh, current organization about uh, the development and uh, coming to the operational excellence. Um, we couldn't uh, perform that meeting due to the current uh, pandemic. And um, thanks to that, we started to look into an alternative. Um, and uh, I, we agreed with Niklas actually to uh, start this education where we started the um, uh, the first step of the operational excellence, uh, and um, uh, that that was a very uh, good start. Uh, we had um, uh, we we had the uh, education taking place for more than a hundred leaders in the organization, uh, and um, when we uh, continued uh, talking about how to develop the organization we decided actually to go for the for the next step in operational excellence and that that's where we are today and what kind of effects do you see so far what have been the results well uh, already from the beginning with the foundation course um, we could actually see new ways of working and especially as someone mentioned here earlier we started to talk a similar language uh, we started to um, to look into the the different uh, possibilities with this uh, new way of uh, of approaching our uh, challenges um, and that was almost uh, uh, that was almost taking place from the from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been even more emphasized uh, as uh, as the uh, education is taking place and going on. Uh, so I would say that that is definitely a, a good effect that we see so far. What is most valuable with using a platform like this? Well, I I, I think um, th this is. Uh, uh, there are many small things that make a total package at the end and uh, the possibility for groups to work together uh, uh, within uh, with in their own pace within the frame that we set um, we have uh, the access to the explanatory films that was mentioned um, I, I i find it very very good uh, to uh, and that, that contributes the common language. Uh, we have a good overview of the progress uh, of each member uh, in the groups. Uh, and we, we have tools like Miro enabling to visualize the work and to get inspired by, by, by other groups. And I'm very eager actually to go forward within, with the next step in the, in the education where we can start to uh, exchange experiences even more. Mm -hmm. And what will that spe uh, step be, Roberto? Well, we we are now in the in the uh, part that we call the implementation course, uh, or uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, we have set the deadline for finishing the that uh, the. Um, uh, the module one, which is uh, before the summer, uh, and we will have uh, we we will look into that deeper to see the outcome and uh, uh, the result of that, and then we will take a new um, uh, start after the summer uh, in order to complete the the, the following modules. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I tell you, we we have the. Uh, the uh, workshops together with Niklas and uh, we have a very good presence in the organization. So my 100, approximately 120 leaders, they are very eager to see the next step. Thank you for sharing, Roberto, and good luck with the next step. Thank Niklas, you. um, your plan is also to create a, a number of programs for specific industries and we'll briefly hear about the first one, which is aimed for the construction industry. Why is this an important step? Well, even if we talk about operational excellence, uh, I mean, operationalexcellence.com is mainly focusing on a on general programs that is applicable everywhere, but some industries have very complex settings. For instance, the um, uh, construction industry, they have a construction project, 
which is only building one building or whatever they're building one time. And there can be 30, 40, 50 different companies involved in a project uh, with different cultures, with different mindsets, with, with different understanding about what is efficiency. And uh, what we see there is that we want to develop a specialized program focusing on onboarding all the people in the project, irrespective if you are working with design or construction or procurement or if you the client themselves, so they can hit the ground running and start developing their own routines, even if they're working for 40 different companies. So a project-based setting is very different from, for, for instance, a, a hospital or a factory. That's why we will launch uh, uh, constructionexcellence.com uh, later uh, this summer. To give them a common language, as we've heard also in, in these examples. So our next guest is contributing to Construction Excellence. He's the CEO of the German management uh, consulting group Refine Projects. Uh, welcome to Klaus Nihinson. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you guys. Great <laughs> that you could join us. Um you will be one of the experts um, contributing with courses and programs. Um, how have you adapted the solutions to the specific requirements of the construction industry, Klaus? Um, well, basically, I adapted it similar as Niklas and Henrik um, showed their story. They you're adapting it with your story in the industry. So they have had uh, Toyota and Japan as a story. My story is that I'm since 23 years in construction in many different roles. And I using this story, um, how I have worked as a carpenter, how I have worked as a site manager, how I have worked as a project manager, and now also in my role as professor for lean construction in Germany, how I now teaching students differently, how they can change and helping me to transform the industry. Mm -hmm. And using the program and using my role as an expert counts that in. Uh, that means really uh, using stories to align with the different people from these diff 50 different companies and different cultures, um, how to connect together. And for me, it's one very important thing. Um, it's people in construction projects, they love flow. They always, they all want to have flow and working in a smooth workflow. And in order to achieve that, you need to have all these uh, basic concepts, basic principles, the common language. And this is what we're creating in construction. We have been really good um, in, uh, in our way with Lego simulations. However, this is restricted to a, sh a small portion of uh, people we can reach. And uh, since as a um, startup owner, I really want to achieve something in the world and therefore I need to scale. And the platform is the best thing to scale and to reach more people and to reach people fast mm -hmm. to understand these concepts. I know that Niklas and Henrik are looking for experts to develop content for different kinds of industries. What does it mean to be an expert? Can you, uh, and what's your role? <laughs> For me, it means, um, first of all, a lot of honor um, to be part of this uh, movement because I believe this will change the way industry is transforming towards agile, towards operational excellence, towards lean. So it's an honor to be an expert. The second thing is I I believe being an expert is you need to have a story and you need to be able to explain it and to tell it. Or as Hendrik said earlier, um, I'm enjoying it to understand the topic by myself very clearly in order to being able to explain it in a very simple, efficient way. And I believe this is a very key element for being an expert. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you hope to, what kind of companies do you hope to attract with uh, with the launch of of the specific construction program? Well, I believe we attract uh, the whole construction industry. Um, so we already attracting with the base, uh, with the foundation program, we already attracted um, other companies like um, huge uh, consulting or project management firms in construction. Uh, we're talking with uh, huge contractors in Europe, in Central Europe. And I believe with a construction specific content, uh, we can reach that out and we can go to the big organizations as well as to the small organizations. And especially with the setting of having different languages involved as well thank you so much for joining us klaus thank You're you welcome. for today so i'm thinking as i'm hearing about um the program how is sort of insights and ideas and learning captured and built into the next release or is it i mean 
<clears throat> our programs or courses, uh, the, the, the smallest building block is what we call the module. And that's, if we were to uh, pick out the Lego simulation, that's a could, maybe could be with Hendrix explanation, maybe 10, 15. That's the smallest building block and that's only the inspiration. Then we add questions to that. What can you in your organization do with this inspiration that you got? And then every, once ev everyone has done that, then you, you, you gather and discuss that. So that's a module. And when we combine modules, then we have a course. A course can be between 12 and 16 different modules with different themes. So uh, one module that uh, we've been uh, developing for many years is the foundation course within operational excellence that is 16 modules with different stories. So as soon as we hear a new story, I can take out one module and put in a new one. So we try to find the best stories, the best metaphors. I mean, I've even stolen Hendrix videos and say, put into my programs and say, I, my, uh, the leading expert within Agile is Hendrix, so why? Shall I try to explain it? And then I bring in Hendrix video. So, so it's like a buffet where we have different e ingredients. So it's, uh, we package different courses, but some of our clients, they, they want to have uh, tailor-made and then we can say, well, this is our buffet. What do you want to eat, so, so, so to speak? So it's, it's about finding the best ahas and then just think about how do I package that and then go into studio, film it, and then it's uh, scalable. Mm -hmm. That's my view. Uh, Hen Henrik, what's the next industry-specific program on the horizon? Uh, well, we're going to look into creating a software excellence program, which is aimed at any company that does software development, either as their main thing, they're developing software products, or as an internal enabling function for the rest of their business. Um, because software is a little, it has some special things. For example, if you compare software and construction, there are some similarities, but some differences. Once you've built a house, you can't move it one meter. With software, you can. A house is visible while you're building it. Software is by nature invisible. So there are some differences. So it's kind of a customized program for how do we apply lean, agile, operational thinking into the software industry. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of questions in the chat on, and thanks for all your comments. It was impossible to interrupt. Um, so I'm also seeing um, Joachim Harby uh, answering some of the questions. You're, um, he's also on the team. Um, but everybody wants to know what happens now. Is there a demo? Can I access the platform? Um, let's talk about that because there are lots of questions. Well, we are releasing the platform today, operationalexcellence.com, where we basically just describe what type of services do we have. Um, we um, <laughs> coded down all the different courses and programs. And I mean, we have, we have inspiration, uh, which is very short programs. Then we have training, and then we have assessments, and then we have development courses, and then we have full transformation programs. And we, when we put in that, it was like too much. So we took it all away. So now we only describe what it's all about. And uh, in two weeks, I will have the demo about the operational excellence program, which I've been developing for 10 years. And as uh, Roberta Trafikverket, uh, they are taking that. So I'm going to give a demo about how that program Program or that full transformation program is working. So we're going to release program by program. And then we have the construction excellence. Uh, and then in, in August, if the software excellence, and we are building all these different types of, 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 um, uh, of programs. One is also leadership. We are working with the best leadership uh, um, experts. So, so leadership will also be, have a big launch during, during the uh, autumn. But we are looking for new experts because we really want it to be a nice buffet of, of, of interesting things. And one, if you are watching today and you want to get an invitation to the demo... Uh, where do I... You go into operationalexcellence.com, you can get the demo. That's the easiest one. Tomorrow you will get an invitation where I will demonstrate how it actually works. We chose not to do it here. So then I will show the platform, the different courses and so on. And that will be on the 16th of June, a Wednesday. Um, and that's the starting point. And if you want to have a personal demo, just go in and, and, and on, the, on the platform and we'll, we'll see. But it's now it's only um, an open platform where we show how we work and uh, we will launch program by program. But yeah, and, and, and if I you want to raise your hand and say, I'm an expert, um, I can contribute, um, who do I turn to? I guess the same thing, right? Go to the yeah. site, contact us there. There's contact information. Uh, but I also want to emphasize that this is, uh, like all products, an evolving thing. So your feedback is super useful. Anything we can do to make the site better, more informative, just, uh, just let us know. Mm -hmm. 
And at this point, I know you love feedback, you guys. So if you could just go to the chat and tell us what was most valuable today, if you have any feedback to Henrik and, and uh, Niklas, and maybe to me as well. Um, I'll take a, a few more comments because we have maybe five more minutes. Um, so uh, there is... There is one question that's like this. I can understand that online self-learning material can be offered on a platform, but how do you fit the people together and bring them to the common workshop to share their ideas? How do you create a safe space for meaningful and insightful discussions where you use the platform together? Um, well, we um, first of all, on the platform, it's... Uh, um, we have also something called self-planning or, or self-management, so they can plan this workshop themselves. But since we use a train-the-trainer structure, um, we usually start with a top management team. And if that top, top management team is secure and they know this is what we want to do and they have commitment, then they usually take it and then they create the safe, safe space for the next level. And if that is not a safe space for them, then it's the top management's role to fix that. And we, we teach them that that's their role. In some cases, maybe it's a little bit unsafe up in the top management, then we can give uh, our, our support and help them in the, during the workshop. But we try to minimize that uh, as much as possible. But again, we, are, we see us ourselves as a publishing firm. We are working with different agents. And if organization wants support, we have our agents in Germany, in, in, in Finland, uh, or in, in Norway, or anywhere that can help. And as you said, you invited other experts. We also invite other agents. If you're a university a consulting firm that you want to sell or, or be a part of this spreading knowledge, we are more than open to, to welcome you in our team. Mm. Um this was an idea this was a piece of feedback I, I think you will like Henrik uh, I really appreciated the motivation to visualize the current situation um, from Caroline uh, Morrison Thanks. this will be a great uh, exercise as I am new in my organization and I see so much improvement potential um, scalable turbo engine um, is something that you also took away um, that you can and uh, will simplify m the most complicated things uh, into um, storytelling uh, that can engage many people are yeah. some of the comments. Yeah, it's important, to, it's important to keep in mind that as we talk about metaphors and we share stories, everything looks simple on a slide. <laughs> Right, so we intentionally make things look simple to to convey a concept, but the devil is in the details. Implementation is not simple; it's, it's complicated. So, so otherwise, we would have already done it, and we'd all be finished. So, mm. yeah. Mm. <laughs> Anything else before we uh, before we close that you want to add? What are you look most looking forward to in the development coming up in the neck in the upcoming months? I think I love to work with our clients when we offer them uh, a module and we are in the workshop and we get feedback and then we go back uh, to our studio and we make uh, new products and we see how that land. And uh, I mean, listening to customers like Roberto, uh, who has engaged on this in an amazing way, I, I think that that's what motivates us. Uh, how can we actually help to improve because the world is very sub-optimized. Mm. Uh, and if we can contribute a little bit uh, to the, to, to uh, uh, make a better world, it sounds big, but I mean, we have challenges everywhere and it, it's a lot of inefficiencies out there. So if we can start a movement where everyone starts to use their brain in the best way and go in the right direction, I think we can make change really fast. I think you have started a movement, Henrik. Uh, well, yeah, we've been trying to throw wood on this fire for many years, <laughs> but hopefully this will help us scale it a little bit. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was the end of the show. It's been great having you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.